think let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Robiner Health and Climate Justice Lecture Series. My name is Lindsay Audi, and I'm a nurse practitioner with the Hospital Medicine Service at M Health Fairview. And I will be moderating this exciting session today. The Robiner Health and Climate Justice Lecture Series is being presented by the University of Minnesota Medical School's Climate Health Action Program, or CHAP, uh, which is a sustainability program within the Department of Medicine. This lecture series has been developed to build community and raise awareness within the healthcare community about the intersection between climate change and social determinants of health using the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today's discussion will focus on the UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven, which is clean and affordable energy. Approximately 789 million people worldwide lack access to electricity and for their activities of daily life that require energy, they're left to use carbon fuels that not only add to the global production of greenhouse gases when burned, but can also harm the immediate environment of their living spaces. <clears throat> Though the UN Sustainable Development Goals were created to address global problems, today's topic of energy accessibility is particularly pertinent on a local scale especially when we consider the impacts of energy insecurity and energy burden on population health. We know that creating true partnerships with the community requires listening. So today we have three members joining us whose individual professional work, in my mind, encompasses energy as an environmental justice issue, addressing themes of accessibility, sustainability, and equity. Our hope is that we all learn about the work our communities are already doing and how we can become more engaged. So on the panel today, we have Carmen Crothers, uh, Outreach Director for the Citizens Utility Board or CUB. As the Outreach Director for uh, the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota, Carmen is passionate about providing practical information to Minnesota consumers so they can reduce their energy use, understand their energy options, and save money on their energy bills. Carmen came to uh, CUB or CUB in 2016 with a variety of experiences, including work in financial services, sales, education, and urban planning. She, hold a she holds a bachelor's degree in local and urban affairs from St. Cloud State University and a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Iowa. We have Shane Stennis, Director of Sustainability with the University of Minnesota. As the Director of Sustainability for the University of Minnesota, Shane leads the university's efforts to improve the sustainability of campus operations, particularly as it relates to energy, food service, construction, transportation, water, and waste management systems. Prior to becoming Director of Sustainability in 2015, Shane had a variety of positions, including uh, Chief Administrative Officer for the University's Facilities Management Department, Sustainability Coordinator, and Human Resources Professional. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and International Relations from, from St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict, and a Master of Human Resources degree from the University of South Carolina. Robert Blake is with us. He is the CEO of Solar Bear. Uh, Robert or Bob is the owner of Solar Bear, a solar installation company located in Minneapolis. Uh, the Ojibwe pronunciation is Gizisomakwa. Um, Am I close? <laughs> Yay! Rob, Bob is executive director of Native Sun Community Power Development, a nonprofit located also in Minneapolis. Bob is a graduate student at the University of Minnesota Carlson Executive Master of Business Administration program. Bob is a tribal citizen of the Red Lake Nation. His passion is spreading the word of renewable energy through communication, cooperation, and collaboration. For our format today, I'll briefly go over some of the basics of energy accessibility and how it intersects with health, climate change, and equity. 
Then I will invite our speakers to share their stories. We should be wrapped up with our presentations by about 12.45, 12 12.50, um, and then we'll head into a Q&A session. So um, while we're talking, please feel free to drop your questions into the chat and myself and Jessica will um, bring those up and we can invite our speakers to answer them. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, in the last year and a half that CHAP has been active, we've all been learning together what our message is, to whom it's directed, and how we measure our progress. Um, I think, however, as healthcare providers, the question we're always asking ourselves um, is what is the impact of climate change on the health of our patients? Um, and of course, what can we do about it? Um, it's worth acknowledging that Minnesota has made notable progress in prioritizing clean energy, um, especially over the last decade. Um, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, uh, Minnesota ranks ninth in the nation um, in total generation from wind energy, 22% uh, of total in-state electricity and 74% of renewable energy um, came from Minnesota wind farms in 2020. And over the last nine years, electricity from coal-fired plants um, decreased from 53% in 2011 to 25% in 2020. And while this is hopeful news for the planet, we have to consider you know, who benefits from, um, from these great strides that we're making um, and who continues to be left behind. Um, examining social determinants of health, such as education, employment, socioeconomic status, household income, race, gender, health status, particularly um, those who are physiologically vulnerable, um, can help us understand who is at risk for higher energy burden and insecurity, um, especially since these issues can result in multiple areas of concern for those of us working in healthcare. Um, our patients who contend with energy insecurity bear incongruent burdens related to their own health and well being that may outweigh any strides made in the pursuit of clean energy when accessibility is in question. Energy insecurity is defined as the inability to adequately meet household energy needs and can be influenced by limited and faulty infrastructure, affordability challenges, um, and service disruptions due to disasters or extreme weather events. Um, and energy burden refers to the percentage of household income that goes towards energy cost, um, or what we think about as the monthly utility bill. Uh, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy found that lower income households across the US experience higher median energy burden compared with non-low income households. To quantify this, low-income households spend about 7.2% of their household income on energy bills, whereas non-low-income households typically only spend about 1.5%. Um, even more staggering, wealthy households tend to consume more energy per month, but they spend uh, much less, only about 1.5 to 3%. African-American households experience the highest rates of energy insecurity across the board, independent of income, and renters or tenants of older buildings are at disadvantage as well if their dwellings haven't been weatherized or had any energy efficient upgrades. So when we think about the patients we care for every day, whether they're in the clinic or the hospital, odds are they're coming from these settings and coming from these backgrounds. And to put this in perspective, our patients who experience um, these issues are more likely to experience adverse health complications or outcomes, um, especially if they're forced to being, uh, if they're forced to choose between paying a utility bill or buying their medication. Um, for some of our patients, paying for energy and medicine are one and the same. Um, for example, uh, LVED patients will always need access to electricity to power their devices. Uh, patients with diabetes will always need to keep their insulin refrigerated. Um, and apart from this, we know with climate change, patients with chronic conditions are more susceptible to temperature related illnesses such as heat stress, stroke, or hypothermia, uh, which is worrisome here with our long, harsh winters. Um, they're more likely to experience exacerbations of chronic illness, particularly related to cardiovascular, respiratory, and kidney complications, and worsening mental health issues related to stress, depression, and anxiety. 
Um, they're typically at risk for illnesses related to environmental hazards or exposures due to geography alone. And for these low-income individuals and communities of color, it's not necessarily a modifiable risk factor, unfortunately. When we consider these populations through the lens of healthcare utilization, it's alarming to realize that inaccessibility to energy means they have no, spa no safe space to reliably go. Uh, being outside on poor air quality days may result in asthma exacerbations or inside without air conditioning, it's breathing in toxic chemicals. So with these concerns in mind, I wanna turn it over to our speakers. I think we will start with Carmen. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I really appreciate you tying in these things with um, health and climate and energy. I think it's a really important connection and excited to be here. And um, Bob, <laughs> so Bob and I are actually both in Red Lake. We're just like a wall apart, so we don't have echo. And um, I think all of you will appreciate that we're in um, a CNA training facility <laughs> right now, um, finding space. We were next door giving a giving a talk a little earlier about energy efficiency and um, renewable energy and energy savings. So it's all very like timely and appropriate. Um, I am going to share a few slides that are going to um, highlight um, a lot of the things that, that you talked about and how it relates to the work I do at the Citizens Utility Board. So I'm gonna share my screen right now um, and get this, get this up. And do that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna be covering a wide variety of topics, so, you know, very similar to what Lindsay covered and just trying to apply it a little bit more into kind of the everyday work um, that we do at the Citizens Utility Board. Um, just to start out, our organization is a nonprofit independent consumer advocate. So we're really um, meant to be, help be the voice of consumers across the state of Minnesota, advocating for them. Um, we really advocate for affordable, reliable, and clean energy. And we're trying to provide information so that um, households have all, all of the info they need to make good decisions about, um, about their energy choices and usage and to have safe and healthy homes. Um, so we were asked a little bit to um, talk about our own kind of background and, and what brought us to this work. So um, as mentioned in the bio, I have a pretty um, diverse um, career path. I've done a lot of different things in my life, um, but I think my my studies had an environmental focus. So when I was studying environmental, um, sorry, um, urban planning, I kind of specialized in both environmental and transportation planning were kind of my specialties at that point in my career. And the work I'm doing now really brings full circle all of the things I've ever done in my career. Um, I most recently worked in financial services. So I love helping people save money. Um, I um, also did some substitute teaching abroad. And so a lot of the work I do is interacting with communities and um, giving talks and presentations and having conversations. And we're, both, we're all learning from each other in that role, which is great. Um, and um, I did some sales work too, where you know, you're really just chit-chatting with a lot of people. And that's a lot of what I, I do on a daily basis. And the urban planning stuff, kind of this holistic view of the world is really helpful when we're talking about like this energy transition and how does it affect communities and individuals. So I'm really grateful to have a role where I can apply all these unique experiences and work with a lot of great, great organizations and people. And so that kind of leads to the next thing about partnerships. Um, all of the work that we do at CUB, almost all of it is based on partnerships. So just that example of Bob and I working together, we, we do um, we've partnered on a, a variety of different things, and that's really fundamental to um, helping communities understand what's going on and, for, and learning, and, and more particularly learning what communities need um, when it comes to energy. What, what are the challenges they're facing? Um, how, can, how can services be provided in a better way to meet meet their needs? And we're really focused on serving people and consumers. So all the work we do is trying to improve the lives of, of people that we interact with when it comes to energy issues. Um, but it, it addresses a lot of other interrelated things. So 
um, just for example, this talk we gave next door just a few minutes ago, we were talking about utility protections. And I wanted to make sure I mentioned, um, like there's, if you have a medical device, you can get special protection from your utility to avoid a shutoff. So things like that are very um, important and important for consumers to know. They might not know if, um, you know, if they need life-saving insulin that they can go to their utility and find out if they can get protection for that so their refrigerator isn't shut off at some point. So um, it, it was really nice um, that Lindsay talked about energy burden because that is um, it's a, one of the major focuses of our work and um, talked about, you know, kind of the average. So when you add in the highs and the lows of what people are paying for average, it's about three and a half percent. But as mentioned, some people are paying a much smaller percentage. Some people are spending a much higher percentage of their income on heating, cooling, and electrifying their homes. When you spend 6% or more, that's when it's technically considered a burden, where there's an expectation at that, that it's going to be hard for you to actually cover those bills. And so when you look at the qualifications for um, a federal program called energy assistance, um, in a typical year, half a million households qualify for that, meaning that the government has determined that their income and household size is such that they probably need some help with their bills. That's a lot of households. And as mentioned, um, not all those folks apply um, for it. Unfortunately, we try to get the word out to encourage people to apply, but I think it gives an, an idea of like the number of households that, um, you know, economically can be struggling to pay those bills. And when you're facing energy burden, it is all of these really difficult choices between necessities and, and health care being one of them. So kind of like looking towards the future when we think about energy justice and trying um, to make sure people have good choices and they have the services they need and then, and then energy is um, generated in, in an you know, affordable and clean way. We're also pointing out that um, consumers actually are going to be playing an important role in the future of energy. One of the big trends that many of you are probably aware of is this increase in renewables that was, that was also cited a little bit. Um, and it's gonna be important for consumers to help support this, this journey to more renewable power. And that means that we're gonna have roles in shifting um, or helping manage kind of the supply and demand of energy. And that um, is, is going to be important in making sure that as we get more renewables on the grid, that our, our system is sustainable. Um, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, some of those things. So price is one, one of those common signals used to affect behavior. And one of the things we want to do to make the grid operate um, as well as it can when we have more and more renewables on it is, again, controlling that supply and demand. So that may mean us shifting when we use energy. So for example, the wind blows most at night. Um, the sun is up during you know, peak times of the day. So it's very likely that in the future, we're gonna see more of a move towards our electric rates matching that supply and demand. So we will be incentivized to use energy when it's less expensive and more plentiful and to try to conserve um, when it's less plentiful and more expensive. So these are things just to be kind of be, be thinking about. And um, these things are important because um, when we're talking about demand for electricity, you know, the first step we should all be thinking about is trying to reduce the demand through energy efficiency. And this slide here um, is depicting the age of housing stock in Minnesota. And over half of the housing in Minnesota was built before the 1980s. And that's important because building codes were widely adopted in the state in the late 70s. So when we're meeting with people and talking about their energy use, one of the things I want to find out is when was their house built? Because the likelihood of them having insulation um, is dependent on if there was a building code in place at the time that their home was built. And that's one of the first things people should be looking at with their homes is to make it more efficient. So adding insulation to attics, um, walls, air sealing things. So when you think about half of the housing stock being built before 1980, there's a lot of potential across the state, uh, most likely to make those homes more efficient. And the other thing I wanna to touch on too, and from a consumer standpoint is the choices we make, how efficient we are 
how we power our homes, um, timing is super important. So um, there's this concept called beneficial electrification where um, the idea is as the grid gets cleaner with electricity is that we try to move away from fossil fuels, um, heating our homes, heating our water, um, cooking our food and electrify it because it'll be cleaner. But timing is really important in actually making this a reality because how often do you replace a furnace? Um, about every 20 years, how about an air conditioner? Every 20 years, water heater, 10 to 12 years. So you need to be thinking about these choices when the opportunities arrive. Um, and so this is some another area we're kind of trying to sort of emphasize is this pre-planning so that if you wanna to move towards electrification, you have these finite opportunities kind of in, in the life of your home to do that. Um, the other thing when we talk about environmental justice, as we move to more renewables and as we move to electrification, um, some of these things are not, not easy transitions and not without costs. So we also have to be super sensitive to who gets left behind during this transition and what can we do to address that. Um, so uh, a wealthier household may not have a problem, you know, switching to a nice um, fancy electric stove, a uh, lower income household very well might. And as there are fewer natural gas customers, those left behind may be paying a higher rate for, you know, because there's fewer people to spread the costs around. So um, these are things that we're interested in, concerned about from a consumer advocate standpoint, um, and just providing kind of a good sampling of the variety of issues to think about um, when it comes to energy consumers roles and energy justice. And I have my contact information if anyone's interested in um, talking after the presentation. And with that, I'll stop sharing and um, pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carmen. Lots of interesting things to, to consider. Um, let's see. Bob, how do you feel about presenting next? Yeah, sure. Hey. Oh, all right. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I, you know, I am uh, currently talking to you from a laundry room right now because <laughs> we're, we have to be separated. Uh, but uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, it, it's really interesting just, um, you know, as far as like the work that we're doing here around uh, renewable energy and Red Lake and, and, um, and just how important, you know, I believe that uh, tribal nations are to this transition. Um, because, you know, the reality of it is everyone is that, you know, the utilities are not going to move fast enough. Um, they're not, they're, 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 they're going to move, they're going to drag their feet. And, and, um, and the reason being everyone is, is that renewable energy is a, is a disruptor. It's, it's a, it's a disruptor to the business model. And, and, um, that's why, you know, I, I really feel so strongly about the work that we're doing here in Red Lake and, and why I'm so encouraging, um, to, to, um, you know, to other tribes to go down this path, uh, because, you know, you know, when we do that, you know, we're, we're going to be able to create not only uh, renewable uh, energy microgrids, right? Um, and, and that's going to be a cleaner form of energy. But we're also going to be able to uh, create a thing called a tribal utilities commission. And we know that public utilities commissions has a lot of say over what the the utilities do out here and the the reason why i say travel utilities commission is because you know also i want to be able to give you know like i want to be able to have tribal nations to have a say uh, around infrastructure and around energy infrastructure such as line three right and, and 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 those kinds of things and so so that's why this is really important because we have new technology we have technology time of use meters heat source air pumps, you know, I think Carmen was talking about all that. And, and we want to be able to implement those things in mass. We want to, we, we can't wait till 2025. We can't wait till 2030 before we finally decide to like move off of this. Um, you know, we, we just came off of a year uh, where, 
we weren't driving our cars, we weren't flying around on airplanes, we weren't doing anything, people, and it's gotten hotter, okay? So the time is now. We can't wait until, you know, utilities and everyone else get their act together. We got to move this thing now. And, you know, tribal nations are, are in a unique position because of their, of, of their relationship, you know, with the federal government that other communities and other places don't have. So um, <clears throat> I will say to all of you, support, <clears throat> we su support renewable energy projects on tribal nations because in all reality, this is gonna be helping you too. Um, and um, I, won't, I don't wanna get into the whole thing about a business model and you know, creating and taking market share and creating utilities to buy and sell energy on the grid. But let's just say that in this scenario, um, renewable energy and these microgrids are going to move us quicker, faster, and 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 a lot. Uh, uh, you know, we're we're going to get to to that to that point where we want um, clean energy, and um, and that's really really important. And um, one other thing too, um, you know, I've always been thinking about this though. But can can clean energy help solve a human health crisis? And I, I, I think about the stuff that is happening in tribal communities. And I think about, I believe that clean energy can help solve a human health crisis. And um, that's a real deep and philo philosophical type of mindset or, or, or just idea, right? Um, but um, I saw, I saw a, um, a, a, I saw something that happened out in Oakland <coughs> where, the um where the uh there was a community out there that implemented renewable energy into this uh in richmond california um uh where they implemented renewable energy into the community and the community got healthier you know they they saw crime rates go down they saw um all these disparities that are plaguing the community go down and i'm thinking to myself listen if that little community can do it why can't we do this in like a bigger community like say like red lake right so, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to think to myself, how can renewable energy make a community healthier? And that is a perfect example of that happening. And I want to be able to do that in a much larger scale. And if, you know, we can prove that, you know, this really can happen and, and it be successful, then, I mean, why can't we be doing this in every community, right? And, and why can't we be doing this all over the place? And we already know that, you know, the weather's going to be crazier. It's going to be a lot, you know, unpredictable. So we're going to need renewable energy microgrids. And we're going to need our grids that are less connected. We've seen what cyber, cyber attacks have done to our pipelines, to the pipelines, to other energy infrastructure. So not everything is going to have to be uh, connected like it once was. I mean, there's going to have to be separation uh, of these. So it, it's also a national security issue. Um, so... Uh, anyways, um, I really do believe that, you know, this is the future. This is the way that we need to move. Um, I believe that tribal nations can move quicker, faster, um, leaner, and try to use technology in a way that, you know, other, other, other entities are going to look at this and say to themselves, we need to do what they're doing. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, my, that's my thing around health and renewable energy. And I know that we're kind of running short on time here. So why don't I go ahead... Lindsay, why don't I go ahead and pass over to the next speaker, Shane. All right, that sounds great. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks uh, to Chap for inviting me to be here today. I really appreciate it and um, really treasure this opportunity to chat with everyone. Um, once again, my name is Shane Stennis. I'm the Director of Sustainability at the University of Minnesota on the Twin Cities campus. I think when we think about the university, of course, we think about our great research programs, our educational opportunities, the extension and outreach work we do with communities. And that's all really critical and essential and part of our core mission as an institution. Um, and we have a lot of efforts in that space around sustainability, around climate, around climate justice. Um, but, but where I work on and where I spend most of my time on is on the campus as a physical entity and a place and trying to take those things that are coming out of the academic enterprise, out of the research mission and out of our teaching mission, and then apply them to campus and demonstrate 
you know, you know, the types of communities that Bob was just referencing and the types of organizations Bob was just referencing and creating a blueprint that hopefully other communities across the state of Minnesota and peers in higher education across the country can emulate and replicate as we all try to move toward a future where we don't have greenhouse gas emissions and we're mitigating climate change, adapting to it and making ourselves more resilient to it. So that's really where I focus and spend most of my time um, and what I'm here to talk about today. And one of the things that I wanted to start off with is I think most of the participants on this uh, webinar probably are familiar with the campus, but if you're not, I wanted just to give you a, a picture of it and, and paint a picture for you of it for you in your head. Um, the university, the Twin Cities campus, is a large and vibrant city within a city. We have 52,000 students on campus. Uh, we have over 20,000 employees. We have thousands of patients and clinic um, participants and visitors uh, that visit campus and partake of campus every day. And so, you know, in a, in a nutshell, um, we have roughly uh, in pre-COVID times and certainly as we start to, you know, um, transition into a sort of a new phase of the pandemic and people are getting back together again, it's not uncommon to have 80 to 100,000 people on campus every day. And all those people and all that activity, the research and the teaching and the outreach work that we do, you know, takes a lot of resources to support it. And in particular, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, you know, as a university, as an institution of that size and with our scale and the scope of activity that we undertake, you know, we are one of the larger energy consumers in the state of Minnesota. And historically, the university's energy and the energy that supports the state of Minnesota has come from fossil fuel resources, despite the transition that you know, is starting to be made and moving more toward carbon-free renewable resources like solar and wind, um, we're still heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, and that's certainly true of the university and it's true across the state, whether we're talking about energy in the form of transportation fuels like gasoline and diesel to power, you know, to put into cars and trucks and vehicles on the road, um, whether we're talking about the electricity that supports buildings uh, that you know is powering my laptop right now and powering this presentation, or in the winter months, the natural gas that many of us burn in our homes, um, in our commercial buildings to keep the the rooms warm and to keep people comfortable. Uh, and then certainly, you know, in the form of fossil fuels that go into the electricity infrastructure, into those power plants um, that exist across the country, and you know are being used and combusted and burned to generate electricity for our use. Uh, and as we think about that transition in, you know, sort of the impact of the use of those fossil fuels, they, you know, have really, in, in really simple terms, two immediate impacts that um, drive uh, climate injustices. One is, you know, they certainly create pollution in the form of greenhouse gas emissions that can contribute to climate change. But the, I think the other thing that we also have to remember is that a lot of this fossil fuel combustion happens in the context of cities and in the context of communities. And those have lots of local health air impacts that you know, uh, damage personal human health as well as environmental health. And so by you know, making the transition from a fossil fuel based economy to one that is predicated on renewable fuels and less emitting technologies, we're really helping to not only address and tackle climate change and mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change, but we're also hopefully helping to improve you know, local air quality uh, in bringing, you know, those benefits to communities and making them healthier and helping them benefit from it. So as that is context, you know, the university's journey on, on this particular topic really started in 2008 um, when the university joined what it was called then the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, which is a pledge by higher ed institutions. It's a voluntary commitment uh, a little over 400 institutions have signed it, and it's a pledge by those institutions to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible to net zero, to integrate climate change into research and educational mission, um, and to make plans for how they're going to achieve that. So the university joined that pledge and that commitment in 2008, and it's really been guiding our efforts ever since then. It's a system-wide commitment. All five of our campuses and all of our facilities are part of it. And each campus in the University of Minnesota system has a climate action plan, a roadmap for how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and incorporate climate change into our research and educational mission. Um, 
And I'm happy to say and pleased to say that the university has had really great success since joining that climate commitment in 2008. Um, we've, from 2008 through 2020, reduced emissions across our campuses 45% during that time. Um, and we're on our way to a 50% reduction. And, and starting now, the process of planning for and thinking about how will we tackle that next 50%, which is going to be much more difficult and much harder. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if, if folks are interested. Um, and the way that we're sort of framing this up and the, and the way we're approaching it is we just recently as an institution adopted a new system-wide strategic plan. And in that plan is a goal to build a fully sustainable future, not only on our campuses, but in the communities we work with um, and work for and support. And so that climate action planning process um, that we're going to undertake through the strategic plan will really be a, the place in which we had developed the roadmap for the next, you know, the next decade and decades to come as we try to tackle reducing and eliminating that last 50% of greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully, you know, being able to build a fully sustainable future that is greenhouse gas emissions free and is compatible with, uh, you know, a healthy, safe, stable climate. Um, I think I'll stop there and, you know, turn it back over to Lindsay for questions. I'm gonna throw it a few links in the chat for people who are interested in following up on anything that I just talked about and addressed and uh, looking forward to hearing from you and all your questions. Thank you, Shane. I'm not seeing any questions right now in the Q and A, but we can go ahead and, and open that up. Um, so feel free to submit questions, everyone who's in attendance. Um, I, uh, full disclosure, previously had a life in um, community planning and regional planning um, and did a lot of work on energy efficiency grants um, that came out during the ARA, um, program um, in 2008, 2009. Um, so I'm curious kind of how um, you guys feel about the utility of uh, LEED certification and LEED buildings um, as part of that sustainability plan at the U. Yeah, so it's a good question. So we've been really fortunate in the state of Minnesota to actually have our own sustainability guidelines for public facilities for um, more than a decade now. And that, that certification system is called B3, Buildings, Benchmarks, and Beyond. And as part of it, it has a component called Sustainable Building 2030, which is a performance standard around energy and greenhouse gas emissions that is continuously getting more and more progressive and um, more and more ambitious. And so, so the idea is that by 2030, any new building that is built um, by a public institution using state funds, state bonding funds, will have to be carbon neutral and have to be net zero energy. Uh, and so I, I would say that that really has been our bellwether, uh, more so than LEED. LEED is another good tool, and it's certainly a national tool. Um, but I think the nice part about Minnesota's Buildings Benchmark and Beyond program is it's, it's Minnesota specific, right? And it sort of recognizes the unique nature, and I know we like to say we're unique in Minnesota, um, but unique nature of sort of Minnesota's climate and Minnesota's regulatory and utility infrastructure that, you know, maybe drives sort of different decisions and different outcomes, but ends up at that really ambitious, you know, carbon neutral, net zero energy uh, building by 2030. So that's really what we've been focused on. And it's comprehensive too. It's not just energy. It talks about site and water um and a number of other factors but that's really kind of i think a focus that's relevant for for climate that is fascinating i didn't know that um we had those sort of guidelines it sounds like it might even have a little bit more um teeth to it than than lead does so that's that's super helpful um okay hey shane i got a question for you is the is the is the builders are they I mean are they coming out you know I I remember reading that article from um, it was in the uh, oh boy I can't forgot what where it was at but uh, Kim Havy uh, from Minneapolis was uh, did the article in that national magazine um, and it was about the building um, the builders were giving some pushback around uh, you know the 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 build the around just the energy efficiency projects around 
around buildings and stuff like that. Did, did you see that article? Kim Havy was the Kim Havy was the, was was the guy though on there. Yeah, I can't say that I did. I mean, I know Kim. So for reference for folks, Kim Havy is the director of sustainability for the city of Minneapolis, um, and we interface with Kim and his team quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, I had, unfortunately didn't see that particular article. I think our experience has been, you know, getting to that higher level of energy efficiency, getting to net zero is is not easy. Um, and it requires a really concerted effort on the part of everyone involved in the process, the building owner, the architecture enge or engineer, the contractor, and then the trades workers on the ground. Every everyone's essential to that process. Um, and it's a learning process for all of us. And so, you know, I think in, in some respects, it's probably going to be um, sometimes two steps forward and one back. And, and we're all kind of trying to figure it out as we as we go and get to that higher and higher level of ambition. But yeah, unfortunately, I didn't see the article you're referencing. Yeah, it was like a Vanity Fair or, um, you know, oh, Huffington Post. It's Huffington Post. Yep. Yeah. But a great article, though, and just talks about how the builders and everyone are just there. You know, it's it's a, there's some pushback around, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the sort of a lot of this, you know, green, you know, certification stuff. So and, and Kim did a great job, by the way, on that article. Wow. Sounds like great press. Um, don't see any questions out there yet. Um, I know something that has kind of come up in our conversations with CHAP when we think about our own projects. Um, and, you know, I'll kind of open this up to, um, to you three. It might be maybe possibly more pertinent to Carmen, but um, one of the things that we think about is like our patients who are, um, you know, readmitted for um, different like chronic health exacerbations. You know, I, I think mostly like of respiratory problems. Um, but um, is there, you know, one of the things that we are curious about, like, um, is there a way to look kind of by census block or by um, zip code to see kind of where like energy spikes are in usage? And maybe we use that kind of data to, you know, target like health interventions. I don't know if that's something that has ever come up, but it's it's something that I've, you know, that's kind of percolated in some of our conversations. Um, just kind of wanted to see what you guys thought about that. Yeah, there um, there is like census data that talks about um, how much is expended on energy. Um, so that would be a pretty good indication of energy use, assuming, you know, more energy use equals more money spent. So um, in fact, Gabe Chan at the University of Minnesota, um, is he's working with us on a, a project related to energy equity. And we're um, looking at trying to understand kind of geographically different disparities and things that are happening in the Twin Cities. So yeah, I think that's that's a really good, um, a good thing to be looking at is those ties between um, more prevalence of health issues and how it probably corresponds to several other factors um, related to, um, yeah, energy use, which probably relates to energy efficiency levels, which relates possibly to income levels. All those things, I think, can be really interrelated. Um, one kind of related thought on that too, you know, I know um, the hospital systems are usually quite good about like having social workers involved with patients and stuff and just kind of reinforcing that sort of holistic view of their lives and making sure people are aware of like energy assistance, even through that process um, and getting help with those bills and weatherization services to help maybe um, make their homes more healthy, more comfortable to alleviate some of those problems, I think is would be a really nice connection to make at, at that, um, at, during that opportunity where they're getting health services. I think that's even an important point of practice change for us. So thank you for that insight. I think that we have a question from um, the audience. Bill Robiner says, thank you to the panelists and says, Shane, can you say more about why you think achieving the reductions in the future will be harder to achieve than initial reductions in pollution and energy use that you mentioned? Yeah, um, happy to. So uh, I would I would say it's kind of twofold, and maybe I'll explain it by talking about the progress we've made so far has largely been focused on 
you know, shifting um, how we get our electricity and how it's sourced and provided. So uh, the, there's a, been a couple of factors there. You know, the utility has improved. Excel is our primary utility for the Twin Cities campus and Otter Tail for Morris and Kirkston and Minnesota Power for Duluth and Rochester Public Utilities in Rochester. Um, and they have all made progress in terms of green their grid, which has benefited customers across the state. And the university is not immune to that or alone to that, uh, alone in that. Um, the second piece that we've done already is we've also started to move more of our electricity supply to renewables um, through community solar programs, through utility, what are called utility green tariffs, which are you know wind and solar combined usually, um, and through other mechanisms, on-site renewable energy generation. Uh, and so we're, we're starting to kind of shrink the amount of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from that electricity sector by a lot. Uh, and our hope is that in the not so distant future, we'll be able to you know, completely eliminate that. But that still leaves a lot of emissions from natural gas consumption for heating, still leaves a lot of emissions from, we account for commuting behavior of our, our employees and students. And many of them are still using gas or diesel powered vehicles to get to and from campus. And then the other piece of it is air travel, um, which is also heavily fossil fuel driven. And so consequently, the, I think the complexity is twofold. One is natural gas um, is for the university. And I think for many consumers, and this kind of gets back to some of what Carmen presented, you know, a lot of our buildings are older. A lot of our buildings are not insulated. Um, and even if they were insulated, they still would have a heating demand that is hard to serve with other technologies and devices. Um, heat pumps for commercial buildings are emerging in, in the sector for cold climates, but they're still sort of in their um, early stages and, and have some limitations. And certainly when you're talking about the extent and size of campus, uh, the Twin Cities alone is about 250 buildings and 24 million square feet of space. So that's seven times the mall of America in size. Um, and that's just the Twin Cities. So we have, a, we have a big footprint. We have a lot of buildings to get to, and we have a pretty enormous energy load that we're trying to move. And then the commuting and the air travel are largely choices outside of the university's direct control. So we're trying to influence choice or we're trying to influence outcomes from other entities, whether that be the airlines or that, that is our employees who are using um, cars and vehicles to get to and from campus. So there's some things we can do to support that transition to a renewable economy, but, but a lot of the agency in that is outside of our direct scope of impact. So those are a couple of reasons why it's, I think it's gonna be harder for this next 50% to, um, but certainly not insurmountable. We just, it's gonna take really concerted effort. Lots of creative effort too. And I think that will kind of uh, dovetail nicely with our next question. I think Lalitha has a couple of questions for Bob and Carmen. Um, she says, Bob, your work is so inspiring and I agree. Um, and she says, how can we get involved in the work that you're doing? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, um, we're uh, at, at Native Sun, uh, www.nativesun.org. Um, we're uh, actually, Kevin actually our intern, because he's going to help us with our mailing list. <laughs> we're we're going to put an info at nativesun.org because uh, this is getting pretty popular. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to better, you know, accommodate everyone because we've been, um, we got mentioned in a couple of national articles too with all the stuff that we're doing. I mean, but we're just really busy with, uh, with you know, we're, we're creating this charging network to Standing Rock and, and we're going to be working with all the tribes in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we're working with the Minneapolis, our Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, along with the Heart and Lung Association. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, it's kind of our answer to the pipeline, right? You guys want to build pipelines? Well, we want to build charging networks. You know what I mean? So, you know, because, you know, fossil fuels have such a grip on our society. You know what I mean? So it's like, so we're, we're doing this right now. We're doing this big project right now. But, um, and then of course, we're doing all the solar stuff too and stuff like that. So yeah, just reach out to, you, you can reach out to me, robert at nativesun.org. And then um, I'll get your information passed along to, um, to our program director and she'll she'll be in touch with you too how you can support but thank you everyone for for all that yep and then our next question um, is for carmen um, i saw there is a natural gas plant that's being proposed by excel how can we express our opposition to it 
Great. So um, Excel right now is going through a process called the integrated resource plan where they um, they plan out for several years out how they're going to generate enough energy to serve their customers. And so that process is, is a good opportunity for people um, to be participating and sharing their views about how they want their energy generated. Um, I just sent a text. I'm, I'm not totally up to date on the schedule of that, whether they're still accepting public comments or not, um, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. Um, yes, they are. Um, <laughs> I just kind of text. Um, comments tentatively close Friday, but um, so keep an eye on that. And there's possible there'll be another extension Extension. But that's a very um, appropriate time to be voicing these comments about how you as a customer want your energy generated. Very good. Any other questions? Any thoughts from the audience? I think one of the big takeaways from our conversation today is just kind of the power of knowing your community and knowing how to build partnerships and, you know, asking for what you want because that's how you drive, you know, the resources and the demand. Um, and I think that will be very important in um, coming up with ways to uh, think creatively about the challenge of that last 50%, like Shane said, so. Um, I just wanted to, to build, if it's okay, Lindsay, on yeah. what Car Carmen was saying in response to the public comment period and how you participate in that process. So I, for, for those who are watching and may not be aware, like when it comes to any, any utility decision in the state of Minnesota regarding resources or costs, um, those all are public processes because utilities in Minnesota are regulated monopolies, right? Um, we can only get our power from one, our electricity from one source. Um, whereas in other states, you could shop around, you could get it from different utilities, they would have to compete for your business. Um, and as part of that regulatory bargain, we get to weigh in and, and express our you know, desires as a state, as, as citizens in what we wanna see from our utilities. And that process is coordinated through the Public Utilities Commission. The university as an entity has actively participated in that before and advocated for um, changes to the resources that are serving our needs um, and advocated for more renewables along with other corporate entities, but individuals can participate too. Um, and the thing I just wanted to emphasize here is the Public Utilities Commission can only make decisions based on what's in the record. So you can't assume that they know your intent unless you speak up. Um, so if you really feel strongly about, I wanna see more renewables provided by Excel, you actually have to submit a formal comment. Um, and those formal comments get consideration by the commission and, and they look at every one of them. They have to, by law, consider everything that they are provided in terms of feedback from all, you know, all parties in a, in a process. Um, and so it's a, um, it may seem a little daunting at first, but I promise you it's relatively painless. Um, it's probably more work to set up the, you know, the, the way to get your public comment in than it actually is to write your public comment and send it. But it's really important to engage in that process and to, to express your voice, because that's how we get change, at least when it comes to the electric utility system in Minnesota, and to some extent, the natural gas system in Minnesota. Wow. Did not realize that. Very interesting. Yeah, thanks Shane for explaining that. And I'm gonna put a link um, in the chat that includes um, some information about, about that. It's, um, we've, as an organization, developed kind of an alternative view of what we think the IRP should look like. So, um, you know, we're obviously it's our, our view. You don't have to necessarily agree with it, but I think it's a good starting point in um, learning out how to participate in the process. I think these are all very valuable takeaways for how we can like individually um, advocate for, you know, adding more renewables to the grid. Um, this is great. Any other um, kind of final thoughts or comments from anyone? I see there's a question in the chat from Ned for uh, Bob. Oh, Bob. 
there it is. Yeah. Uh, Bob mentioned a valid concern about cybersecurity concerns and being connected to the utilities. However, it'd be crucial, crucial for liability purposes. Many utilities are getting cleaner, um, such as Excel 80% carbon free by 2030. Any other follow-ups to, to that point of conversation? Was he was he asking me a was he asking a question or I'm sorry I didn't see that. I think it was just a comment. Now that yeah, I see it. Yeah. Comment, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that I just wanted to throw out there, maybe two things, um, and I think Carmen sort of hit on this a little bit when you were asking about. Um, how does this impact health and, and maybe the interface with uh, patients that you might be seeing if you're a healthcare provider? Um, one of the things that I think goes really underappreciated is the fact that you know a lot of our homes we we use natural gas for cooking, we use natural gas for water heating, we use natural gas for heating our, our spaces, our, our houses. Um, and there's really some pretty good information and evidence emerging in the last couple of years around the public health impacts of that and how it impacts indoor air quality. Um, and so I think not many people know that though, and not many people appreciate sort of the risks that they're creating maybe potentially for themselves or their family members when they combust natural gas to, you know, boil a pot of water on the stove. Um, and so that's something too that I've been trying to kind of convey to folks is like, if you have a chance to switch away from natural gas in your own personal life, that might actually have some really tangible health impacts for you. And also natural gas for water heating and cooking is a significant contributor to greenhouse gases in the state of Minnesota. Um, and so those are kind of ways that you can both tackle climate change and you can also improve sort of your local health um, impacts and in, in your outcomes. Um, but I think Carmen also hit on like, you know, the ability to transition is also a justice issue, right? And so we've got to think about as a society ways that we can make that transition accessible for all people and think about how we manage the tail of it to not leave customers who are stranded on the natural gas system putting these huge bills that they really can't afford. Um, and then the second thing I'll say is, I think rough numbers spend about $14 billion a year buying fuels. We have zero fossil fuels. So we are exporting 14 billion Minnesota's wealth to other states and other countries every year that we could keep at home by transitioning to renewable energy. And so I think that's a really uh, powerful economic argument, particularly for people who maybe don't necessarily is an issue or don't believe it's you know, valid. Um, but you know, there's some economic basis for making this shift as well. And we can keep more dollars in Minnesota's borders to support Minnesotans. That would be a good thing. So just two things I wanted more to throw in there. <laughs> For sure. It looks like we have uh, one more um, question um, in the chat. Um, uh, Shane, on the U campus, what ideas do you have for increasing individual behavior or engineering uh, on conserving resources? Um, for example, there are a lot of lights on in buildings at night on campus when no one is there. Um, and how do we decrease unnecessary consumption? And I think, you know, feel free, you know, everyone to chime in on that as well. I'm open to suggestions. It's a really hard thing. Um, behavior change is probably one of the hardest things to consistently see outcomes on that are actually permanent and durable. Um, so it's one of those things we continue to struggle with and try to apply lessons from behavioral psychology, lessons from behavioral economics to the, to the challenge. Um, but I would say our primary strategy around this is putting in more engineering controls to take some of the, some of the um, variability out of, it, out of the equation, you know, make it so we have a computer that's at least in the background who can, has a sensor and can monitor, are there people in the building, can we turn off the lights, right? So that's our, that's one of our philosophies and strategies, but I'm open to suggestions. I mean, this is one of those areas that we continue to um, look for answers. And then Lindsay, I just want to, I just want to appeal to the, like the Minnesota sportsmen out there, you know, that, 
Um, one of the things that really like pushed Red Lake into this renewable energy zone, right? This, re this, this idea of solar um, was we saw high amounts of mercury in our walleye. And, you know, walleye is like the Minnesota's fish, you know what I mean? And I'm saying to all you fishermen out there, like we, you know, we need to, we need to switch to renewables because we definitely don't want all that, you know, carbon coming down into our waterways and we've got great, beautiful lakes and, you know, we want to keep them that way. So um, I just know that the walleye is really important to, to, to us here in Red Lake, native people. It's, it's really been a part of our staple of, of our diet for years. And, and uh, we just saw really high amounts of mercury. And um, we know that that's coming from the carbon coming down from, you know, um, from up above. So um, all you fishermen, all you sportsmen out there, um, there's another good reason for us to uh, switch to renewables. That is an extremely valuable point. I think yeah, it connected to things people love, their, uh, what they look to for leisure, that we have to protect those things because there's no getting them back once they're gone. Yeah. Any other final thoughts or comments? All right. This has been an incredible discussion. Thank you everyone so very much. Thank you to um, Shane, Bob, Carmen, um, and all of our attendees, of course, as well. We're gonna go ahead and start wrapping up. I have just a few things to say in closing. Um, you'll all be getting an email in the next two to three days with a recording of today's event. Um, and then we'll send you the links um, for this presentation in that email as well. Um, we're also going to conduct a short survey on this webinar series and would really appreciate it um, if you're able to participate. Uh, we plan to, you know, use these results that we're getting throughout this series to kind of inform our own changes in education, research, and, and policy and practice at the university. Um, and then finally, I just want to say that we want to showcase our next month's um, lecture on waste justice and sustainability in waste management. Um, the link to register, uh, we'll populate that in the chat or in a subsequent email. Um, and then you can also find it on the CHAP website, which I know Lilitha uh, dropped in the chat at the beginning of our talk as well. Um, so um, I don't have anything else. Thank you again for being part of this discussion. I appreciate your time and your thoughtful comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.